Welcome back to Dirt to Dust. Today, we are going to talk about tire shine. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, let's, I couldn't resist. <laughs> let's not talk about tire shine and said say we did. <laughs> well, it's like it's like the do we maybe this is a mailbag thing. We're going to talk about which is best, like low tire, low shine tire shine or high shine tire shine. Like that's oh, a debate. No, it's, it's, high, it's a debate. High loss and I think we could do an episode with the unicorn glitter. Yeah. Oh, see, that's your position. You I'm leaning away from unicorn glitter and I'm going more towards, I think you just have to go with your, uh, your little accent color. Oh, so, for sure. you know, if you got the Rubicon, I think you got to go with red glitter have to. and, and I don't know, maybe you go matte shine so that the glitter shines out. I don't know. I don't know. But like, anyway, is there a clear coat obviously. for tire shine too? Like you do a layer <laughs> matte, okay. then you put the All glitter, right. okay. then you put We've, the high shine on top of that, <laughs> create layers of tire shine. <laughs> Uh, I'm creating a monster. All right. We've clearly gone too far. We have clearly, clearly gone too far. All right. We are not going to talk about tire shine today. Or ever. I mean, it might come up. Who knows? It might. It, and you know, don't never say never. <laughs> never say never. Uh, that aside, uh, it is time to go back to an episode without an interview for once. I know we've had a lot of, a couple of interviews recently. Awesome interviews. Good Very stuff. Going to have more. But uh, we've got, uh, we got an episode here without, and we're actually going to talk about um, axles today, axle upgrades, what you can do to axles, you know, tire size, relative, all that good stuff. Looking forward to getting into that. So without further ado, here we go. When other people see dirt, you see glory. And when you see a vehicle for the first time, your first thought is not how pretty it is, but how much abuse can it take? <laughs> This is Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off-Road. If it's anything off-road and dirty, we probably like it, and we're probably talking about it. You'll get industry info, tech talk, and interviews with the biggest and best in the industry. Let's do it. This is Dirt to Dust. And now your hosts, Doug Langford and Caleb Forbes. All right, so let's get into this, everyone. Uh, Caleb, axles. Axles. um, Where do we start? So originally, I thought this might be a really good mailbag episode, but then uh, the more I thought about it and uh, ran it by you, like we've got a lot of... uh, of, content and and experience with this subject matter. So the question originally was, what are some things that I can do from like cheapest to most expensive to upgrade my axles? And I think we can talk about that more than 15 minutes. Um, I think we can, uh, I think we can do that. (laughs) I think we can do that for sure. Um, Yeah. So let's from cheapest to most expensive. um, What are some really good ways to upgrade axles? And I think the initial cheapest is going to be We'll call it, well, I think it's a tie between a truss or a sea gusset, but we'll, let's start with trusses. All right. Imagine, if you will, a cool, spinny 3D graphic on your screen right now with like this blow up axle assembly. All right. We don't have the production budget for that. But if you would imagine, um, let's see, I, you, gussets and trusses to me are the same thing. Like I get on the rear, you know, sea gussets aren't a thing. Um, but that's that's pretty much the least expensive gussets. It's just metal for the uninitiated, it's just steel that you're going to weld on to generally the top of the axle tube to make it stronger so that, you know, they call, call it the uh, smiley face effect so that if you beat on that axle enough, it doesn't you know snap in the middle and turn into a smiley face. Um, it just adds like I guess they call it torsional rigidity, horizontal rigidity, whatever the technical term you want to call it is. But it's just strength left, you know side to side to keep that thing from bending and it also it's not a super common thing but i have seen it a couple times is these axle tubes in the non-fabricated axles we'll more on that later where i've seen a couple axle tubes uh spin i've seen that once or twice before you know they'll they'll break their plug weld and spin so i think it would uh it would help with that too so yeah i think that's where you kind of start off the cheapest and i think if you're going to if you're going to go up more than probably one tire size, you know, whatever tire size you're at, um, if you're going to go up two tire sizes, I think you got to start looking at, at stuff For like sure. that uh, in certain axle, in certain, especially on solid axle, 
Uh, you got to start looking at stuff like that. And then, of course, just to go to the rear, it's it's trust only because you don't have C's or because you have steering. That's where the ball joints are. So um, it would just be a truss or a bridge in the back, which just goes over this intersection. Yeah. So I think that is great entry level. I think that's where you got to start. I think you got to do it Two 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 plus tire sizes. I think you got to sure. go there. Now, uh, I do want to touch on this because not every shop is qualified. I want to say I want to keep this. I don't want to go too far into that. Uh, not every shop is qualified to weld a truss all the way. on an axle. Um, what are your What are your tips on on welding a truss to the top of the axle? Uh, wait, wait. You said what are my tips on welding a I, right to prevent uh you know some welding yeah, tips? Well, that's welding tips. tips or just install tips. I'm sorry, um, that was my just for something for uh, was, someone to look bad, out bad for. Joke when they're they're shopping around for a truss and a shop to install because that's not something you're just going to yeah, do in your I, garage on the normal person side i apologize to everyone that was a terrible dad joke that's completely my fault um <laughs> what are your tips obviously welding tips um don't do it on your own like that's my number one tip like there's things you just i get there's a lot of mechanically inclined people out there but if you really don't know what you're doing with voltage and wire speed and if you don't know what those terms are don't weld like <laughs> Just don't do it. My tip there would actually be to take it to somebody who has welding tips. Um, and again, if you don't know what that is, take it to a shop. It's just you got to be careful when you're welding on stuff, because when you're heating up metal to the extent, I mean, you're basically doing the things that YouTube videos would tell you not to do. You're creating a ground and then you're arcing wire electrically to it. like that sounds terrible and dangerous. And and it is dangerous. Like if you don't do it, like it's very, very dangerous. There's specialty equipment. You know, we in the outlaw shops, we wear specialty shirts and you got to wear boots because, you know, some can fall and burn through your shoes and you got to have a helmet, not just a hat. You got to have gloves, full sleeves. You can get like weld burn is a real thing. You don't even have to touch the light from the weld. The arc will literally burn your skin. So my number one tip there would just be to go to someone that not only tells you they can do it, but look for some evidence that they've done it. Um, I'm not saying go in and inspect their shop and, you know, look at what if they got a big body weld, that, that doesn't matter. Um, I am a believer that it is more about the welder than it is about the machine. As long as you have decent equipment, a good welder can overcome bad equipment. A bad welder cannot, a bad welder person cannot overcome great equipment. It doesn't matter what equipment you put them on. If they're a bad welder, they're just going to suck. And if you don't weld it properly, if you don't get the penetration, if you're not actually performing the weld, you just wasted all that money. So Take it to a shop that actually does that stuff. Look for some evidence. Check their Facebook. Check their social. Talk to them. Make sure it's something that they do pretty regularly um, to where you're comfortable with it. And then just, you know, back off. Let them do their job. Yeah, absolutely. So next up, I guess then you, you've already talked about it a little bit, but let's talk about sea gussets and where those are on the axle and what typically happens with them if you don't reinforce them. So that just basically goes in that 90 degree area where the C's, we call them the C's, which where the ball joints go. If you look at the front axle on a solid axle, you got the axle tubes, left side and right side, and then they terminate, they stop into these big C-looking things. It's, we're, we're super inventive and <laughs> off right? They're C's because they look like giant C's. All C gussets do is they fill in that 90-degree kind of void, top and bottom, and that is basically putting more metal there uh, to make it stronger. I, there's, a more, there's a more technical thing there, but you're welding in more metal, you're giving it more strength and so that those C's can't basically bend vertically up and down. You put a C on the top, you put a C on the bottom. Now they don't bend um, up and down because up and down is where they're going to bend. They're not going to generally bend front to back. They're going to, you know, they're going to bend vertically, not horizontally. So that's all that is. It's basically a, uh, it's a gusset um, or I guess we call them C gussets, but they're basically trusses. Yeah. They're just little mini right. trusses. They're no bigger. You can fit in the palm of your hand um, depending on the size of the axle. And it's just a, uh, when they see gussets and C's, that's what people are talking about. A gusset kit with C's is just a more complete front kit where just a gusset's just going to be like a bridge over the axle tubes. When you throw in the C's, now you're throwing in the stuff on those the C gussets as well. So always recommend in a front axle, just do it all. If you know, Some axles are weird and they don't you don't do C gussets on, but if you have an axle that has that room and has available to do sea gusts. Yeah, it's, it's, it. it's cheap it's just, insurance. It's really. required. Just do it. Um, yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. Who would you say are, I mean, I know, I know who we use most, but who are the brands you recommend that, uh, that make a trust and sea gusset kit? 
man, there's a ton of brands out there that make good metal, right? Like they just make good steel. Um, our tech obviously comes to mind only because we definitely use them and that's not showing any preference to them. It's just easy because they have pre-done kits for TJ, JK, JT, JL. They have those kits. It's super, super easy. Uh, but Barnes four wheel drive, Barnes four by four, Barnes four wheel drive is another one. Um, TMR, I think even has some stuff. So there's a ton of company out there. Generally speaking, you don't have to get too deep into researching like gusset and C companies because most of them are in America. You don't have a ton of Chinese companies out there ripping off because it's a small piece and it's not high dollar. So in general, you're not going to see that. So, you know, I think as long as it's a U.S. based company and they're using U.S. steel, uh, I don't think you're going to have a problem. Right. And I agree with that wholeheartedly. Like I said, cheap insurance. It's, yeah. it's not hard. Well, it's not hard for a shop to do, uh, but it's your, your Jeep is down for a couple hours. You get it back and you've got some incredible strength built into that. Auto strength, auto strength upgrade. upgrade plus four. <laughs> yep. It's not quite automatic. But yeah. uh, it's definitely not automatic, but it's 100% a hundred percent of strength. Upgrade. Absolutely. So moving on from those and those are, uh, I would say parts only. You're lo probably looking at you know, five to 600 bucks for, for those two things. And then plus labor it's going to vary from shop to shop. But uh, moving on after that, I think the next. Including the rear. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think the next. Um, Upgrade from there, I think we're going to be looking at drive shafts. Agree? Disagree? Uh, I Not don't drive know. Shafts. I'm so sorry. Axle. I don't know axle that I call shafts. it an axle. <laughs> I missed. You know, I thought you were going to go axle shafts. So you said drive shafts, and then my mind was like, hmm, maybe we can talk about that. I mean, it is. Let you know. I know it was a you know kind of a foobar on your part, but I can see a little bit how drive shafts are an axle upgrade only because they connect to mm -hmm. the axle. But those are generally related to lift height shock extension. But right. they are definitely an undercar upgrade. So um, I know we've had some mailbag questions on on drive shafts. So we probably already touched on that a little bit. But while while that may not be what you meant to say, um, I would definitely throw it in as um, I, I could see that as an axle yeah. upgrade. Maybe not one we're going to talk about for ten <clears> minutes, but it's, axle it's component upgrade. upgrade upgrade. So if you've got you know if you're if you're sure. going up to a thirteen fifty pinion yoke. Um, that's definitely an upgrade that's from, an upgrade from factory. <laughs> um, but that, you know, and we'll talk about weak points in another point, but that does create a weak point somewhere else. But anyways, all right. Axel shaft upgrades. <laughs> wait, wait, do we get to talk about sacrificial yes. anodes? I love talking about sacrificial yeah, anodes. We, we'll get into that for sure. Uh, right, gonna, so on, on. axle shafts upgrades for what I meant to say. Yep. Um, so we're basically talking about what most people would refer to as like chromos or chromolies. Mm -hmm. Chromoly shafts. There's also 300 M, but that's crazy oh, high yeah. dollar stuff. 99% of the market is never going to see 3M. We we did this in an episode a couple weeks ago where I pointed behind me. It's still it's still back there. Uh, the 300 M axle shaft that has snapped. Um, but generally, it's going to be chromoly, chromoly steel. Um, Molly being, of course, molybdenum. I think I pronounced that right. So chrome molybdenum or chromoly steel. Uh, it's just stronger than the stuff that comes in from the factory. And there's various grades of chromo. Uh, for sure, but any grade of chromo is better than the stuff that comes in the factory. So the metal is just better. Um, it's going to handle more load. Uh, it's just a better steel mm -hmm. that's used. So you're going to be less likely to do damage to the splines. Uh, on the carrier side, you're going to be less likely to score it. You're going to be less likely to break it, bend it, twist it. Twisting is a thing. Um, you're going to be less likely to do all those things. And in general, on the front ones also, um, there's there's more com there's more components to upgrade. So you're going to get upgraded U joints. Um, obviously, you got RCV, um, great company RCV Performance. You can go to RCV joints instead of U joints, and that comes as part of an option of what you upgrade when you upgrade axle and shaft. RCV so just a better, better, bigger, better constant steel. velocity. Uh, Really, really, that's what you're. Gonna, <laughs> that's that's not what they. I don't think that's what their RCV stands for. No, but for. it it might not be what their company okay. stands for. But when you're talking about an RCV right. joint, it is it is a rotating Correct. constant velocity joint. Um, yes. So you're getting rid of a U joint style and replacing it with basically almost like a a ball and socket style, which is pretty cool. Uh, but something yes. I want to touch on is with the chromoly, uh, you mentioned uh, rotational strength and axle upgrades uh, or the truss upgrades. This is the same thing. 
Um, so the chromoly, the way that that steel is designed, it can actually twist more than your standard steel uh, axle shaft, uh, which is you would rather twist than break um, for sure. Uh, right. So that's going to allow you to twist the axle shaft in the event of extreme pressure versus just snapping it completely off and, and ruining your day. Um, been there, done that. You don't want to do that on the trail. It makes for a very long day on the trail. No, no. Um, no. Well, which you, if you can twist, but it returns to its original form. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what exactly you want. what you want. And that's what they do. And that's what that, that's what that yeah. stuff does. So it's like the difference between aluminum and steel. When you talk about steering, it's the same, same basic principle, but yeah, it's definite. You know, people think, Oh, I don't want it to, I don't want it to twist. Well, you kind of do. You just want it. You just want material that's going to twist and return right. to form. And there are some other companies out there. We like RCV. It's good stuff. Uh, who else makes chromoly? Oh, yeah, for sure. Axle shafts. Well, I mean, again, kind of going to say the 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 RC or the Artec thing because they're readily available. I mean, it's pretty easy to just grab a set of Yukon axle shafts mm -hmm. when you're doing when you're doing gears or something. It's pretty easy to grab a set of Revolution shafts. I mean, there's so many companies out there that make them now. Axle shafts is one thing that can be made overseas. Mm -hmm. And there's actually some pretty decent ones that are made overseas. Korea is kind of a hotbed for that kind of stuff um, for gears and axle shafts. Um, so, but you're going to see a lower price point and you're going to pretty much know, man, that seems like a really, really good price for that. It's probably overseas mm -hmm. made. Um, and they'll generally call them something different, but you know, just know that. But again, if you're not high level, you know, wheeling stuff, it's still going to be an upgrade. It's just going to be up to your budget. You know, do you, do you have the budget to spend four or $500 more in some cases for us built us made axle shafts versus, you know, something that was made overseas. So again, still going to be an upgrade regardless. Um, just keep in mind, just keep an eye on that. Just know where your stuff, you should always research your stuff, but just know where yeah, it's absolutely. From. And, um, on the JL specifically, JK guys don't have to worry about this, but the JL has this wonderful little thing in the axle called the front axle disconnect, um, uh, mm, <laughs> to delete mm -hmm. or not to delete mm -hmm. the fad. Huh. <sighs> Ah, uh, man. Okay. So the fad or the CAD, that's a debate right there. The front axle disconnect or the center axle disconnect. Um, it basically is a thing on the JL platform and the, and the JT where they turned the front passenger side, the longer side axle shaft into two pieces. And there's a little collar in there with a little fork and there's a little motor and it moves the fork. And when you move the collar, it's either locking the two axle shaft pieces Together, it's keeping them apart. When you keep them apart, you're basically, it's a fuel economy thing. That's really all it is. Because when you're able to unlock them and you're not putting power to the front axle, you're able to save a little bit of fuel economy and you're able to not have to turn the front drive. You're basically not turning the front drive shaft under power at all. Um, and you're able to save some fuel economy that way. It's not much, but again, when you save a mile per gallon, that is saving these vehicle manufacturers hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you better believe they're going to throw that sucker in there. Um, so I think if if fuel economy is a thing, and and it shouldn't be, I get it. Everybody's laughing. Right now. Why would buy a Jeep or, or Bronco? Or, okay. Go to any Facebook group and I, I tell me in five minutes that people don't care about they the fuel do. economy. For they sure care. they do. Way more than they probably Which should. Miles per gallon but if you're in that group, on. I get Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you're in that group, you can buy a two-piece axle shaft. There isn't, there really isn't, I don't, there really is not a big difference in strength. Mm -hmm. There really isn't. I mean, the Jeep Martin Jeep made that thing pretty good. I think there's only like a five to eight percent tested is an actual strength difference. Um, to put that into real world term, real world terms, you would have to get, you know, within five to eight percent of somebody who is going to break their solid to break yours. Um, that's a lot of beat down. <laughs> like, that's a lot. Um, I've, I've seen some, some fad slash cads fail. Um, it's usually when somebody is absolutely beating on it. And what I've actually seen fail more than the actual fad is where it bounced into the axle tube. You know, people going out and jumping their JLs and then you get the smiley face. I've seen them on Facebook. That's what I've seen fail more than anything else. And that's not really a design flaw. That's um, a abuse. It just, it's a flaw. <laughs> it's, it's an absolute abusiveness yeah. driver thing. So a driver modification. Um, yeah. I think if you're going to wheel the living crap out of it, um, go with the one piece, 
But if you're kind of the average, hey, I'm upgrading this and I'm going to go to Moab here and there, I may go to EJS, I may go, I think it's perfectly fine to do the two piece and, um, and keep maintain the functionality of this center axle mm -hmm. disconnect to maintain the efficiency. And you're also limiting the wear and tear on front axle parts. So that's another little benefit that people don't talk about a lot. So I could absolutely see somebody keeping the two pieces. They're not going to absolutely abuse the living crap out of their. And this is only on JL and JT, right, like right. you this, said. This is not this a JK is not thing. A JK thing. This is not a TJ thing. I think the right. only other this Jeep is, that this, utilized it's not that an IFS is, thing. Um, is a YJ. It was the last one that utilized, and that that's a vacuum disconnect, which is a completely different. That was vacuum. It, you know. Yeah, and those yeah, broke those, all the time. Was, <laughs> they're still breaking. Yeah, completely different later, subject. Still um, yeah. So, other than the fuel economy, is there any downside to going to a one piece shaft? Really, just that last thing I mentioned was wear and tear on mm -hmm. parts, and you're spinning that front drive shaft. So if you're one of the people who maybe didn't replace your front drive shaft, mm -hmm. and you have that, you, you maybe you should have, or you're kind of in line to do that, you're going to wear your front drive shaft out faster. You're going to put, so you're putting power to that through that joint um, at the transfer case side. You could wear some stuff, but I think other than wearing your parts, and you are going to see that slight dis, that slight loss of fuel economy, but if we're already in there doing stuff, you're probably already lifted in on wheels and tires. Anyway, you're probably already getting not ideal fuel economy anyway. So mm -hmm. you'll lose a little bit of fuel economy. You'll lose some wear and tear. You'll add some wear and tear, I guess I should say. Right. Um, not huge things. Just, you know, just know what you're doing. Like just expect that. That's totally normal. Just expect it. That's what it is. It's science. Physics, physics is a thing. What's round about the price point for front or front and rear upgraded axle shafts. Man, I'm going to show my age here because I remember when axle shafts could be bought like front and rear for like less than a thousand bucks, but that's done for. These are, you're, you're going to spend some money. You're going to spend a couple thousand dollars for front and rear axle shafts. It just is what it is. Um, and if you go RCV fronts and even like a chromo rear, I think Dana even makes the chromo rears. You're, you're going to spend some money. I mean, it is what it is. Um, this is not an upgrade for somebody who is not going to wheel their vehicle. It's not. This is for somebody who is like we've talked about before. I'm going to keep my stock axles but I'm going to, you know, throw 38s or 39s or 40s on it. The, they're really required then. Um, so it's just, you know, you got to look at this. It's just part of the, it's just part of the cost of doing business for big tires on little axles. Now I will say this, it is a lot cheaper than replacing your axles. Yeah, that was my next point. It is a whole <laughs> lot cheaper to upgrade your axle than it is to replace it. When you're talking about $25,000 for a set of Curry 70s, um, Homie, don't play right. <laughs> like on pricing. That's expensive. Now we can argue whether or not that's worth it. I say it is. Um, some people may say it's not. But if you're on the side of the on the side of the game that says, "Ah, it's not worth it," okay, fine. Spend a few thousand dollars, um, a fraction. Eh, that's probably more than a. You're, you're probably seven, eight all in. If you're going to really build up a stock axle, you're going to spend six to eight thousand dollars. It just is what it is. Um, when you talk about gearing, when you talk about trussing, when you talk about gussets and shafts, all that stuff. Um, but again, you're doing it because if you don't, you're going to break. That's, that's who needs this. I'm going to go out. I'm going to buy 38s, 39s, 40s, and I'm going to wheel my Jeep. Um, and I, I don't want to replace right. axles, which, you know, that's a bigger market segment than you might oh, think. Oh, for sure. Which you, you touched on the topic, but that's, that was going to be my next, uh, recommended upgrade are gears. And I know we've hammered on this so many times. I don't want to get too far into it, but. Gears, 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 gears. Uh, if you're doing these upgrades to your axles, if you're adding bigger tires, you need gears. Uh, what that gear ratio is, we've already discussed this. <laughs> it changes for, per Jeep, per use, per application, per tire size. To. Oh, um, take a breath. Uh, I'm having PTSD mm, over here. Oh yeah. uh, yes, but I'm, we're just going to harp on it no matter what. To it. Upgrade the gears. If you're putting that much money into your axles, upgrade the gears. It's, it's again, it, you get the benefits far outweigh the cost. Um, and I would say up to that point. So if you've got truss, gussets, drive shafts, gears, I think you have a very solid weekend warrior. Like you said, up to forties, I, I wouldn't push anything past that. Truthfully, I really, depending on your wheeling style and the abuse you're going to throw at it, I wouldn't feel incredibly comfortable with forties, but 37s, 38s, 39s for sure all day. Um, nah, send it. But you can definitely throw the 40s on them and, and feel safe enough that you're not just grinning grenade something. Um, and and that's for the Rubicon. For the Sport Axles, 38s, I think, would be the absolute limit if you have all of those things done. 
Yeah, that's more about the front axle because right. some of those sports and and um, Saharas and all that other, you can get them with the M220, um, lovingly referred to as the Dana 44 uh, rear. And if you do that, then I guess it's the same housing. Now, if you got the 392 or the Mojave, something like that, those are different mm-hmm. housings and those are better anyway. Right. Um, like you're not going to get a Mojave and a JT and go throw an Artec gusset kit on there in a the truck because it <laughs> it's bigger. Axle Everything's tubes. already bigger. Like. It's already there. Everything's thicker or that. So you're not going to do that. Now you can modify it. And we've mm-hmm. done that. You can modify it to fit some of the parts and pieces and you will beef it up. Um, same thing on the rear. I think, I think I like rock crawler a lot for that because, you know, they do that pro X um, where they triangulate the rear on the gladiator and it has that bridge and it's bolt on bridge and they'll tell you it's a bolt on bridge, but they'll also put in their instructions. I think it's actually in their instructions. Now they say, if you're going to wheel it, you can actually weld it to the tube and it kind of pulls double duty as, a nice little truss and it also serves as the mounts for the triangulated links on the upper control arm. So I like stuff like that. I think Evo's got one like that too. I think RPM's got one like that now too. So a lot of companies are going that way. I think rock crawler was just kind of first at it and I'm familiar with it cause I had it on my gladiator. So um, I like stuff like that that can pull double duty. So, um, but I do think, you know, you said gears is an upgrade. I mean, it's not an upgrade when you're stock, right? right? It's one of those things that becomes an upgrade and a very necessary upgrade when you get those big tires up, because again, we go back to, I get fuel economy is not a big thing to some people, but it is a big thing to some mm-hmm. other people. Proper, proper gear ratio is going to save things, you know, long-term your transmission, your transfer case, your sanity. It's, it, <laughs> I Man, it sucks, it dude. Does. It, it does. absolutely sucks to drive something. Cause I'd done it to test it and all that. And I've done, I did the drive. I don't remember what it was. I did the drive, I think from Denver to Moab. And I think I had just, I had just done something to the JL and my tire size was bigger and I wasn't quite geared enough yet. I had bigger gears. I did. I had deeper gears than factory, but they weren't deep enough for what I had. And go every time that freaking Jeep even thought about going uphill. I kind of never saw it from seventh to fourth. It's loud and it's just, oh, it was going into fifth and fourth. Like it was going out of style. Like it was its job. Like it was just like, dude, I hate this. Like. Anybody who says I threw 37s on something, they're like, oh, it's great. I'm like, you're a freaking liar. You are liar, liar, pants right. on fire. Uh, yeah, and even on the highway, even on flat road, I can say 37. And I've I've seen people run 38s. I think it's about the biggest I've seen before they start considering gears. Like, oh, mm-hmm. it was fine. The 410s on the Rubicon was great. Yeah. Um, try, uh, try going on a road trip with that on the highway. And you go to pass somebody you can't. and you can't. It's so bad. Um, and it's, it's so just, terrible. Yeah, yeah. I don't want something screaming at me. And I don't want the transmission screaming at me. It's not, it's not fun. Yeah. And we all know Jeeps don't sound that great at high RPM. No. 392. Like <laughs> the two O turbo is cool of a little engine as it is. Does not sound awesome at 6,000 no. RPMs, Mm-mm. nor does that poor three, six Pentastar not awesome at high RPM. And that's anything that's Toyotas mm-hmm. too. I mean, we gear a crap ton of Toyotas and Ford F one fifty. It's any vehicle. All this stuff applies. It does not matter if it's got a Toyota badge on it or a Bronco, or it doesn't matter when you start getting, Bad. I mean, yeah, you can make the argument even more in Toyotas because they're notoriously, notoriously oh, yeah. geared from the factory. Though now the numbers don't cross over. You know, a, a five twenty nine is not the same as a five thirteen. No. <laughs> they're, they're not the same. They're different axles, yeah. different transfer cases, different ratios, and 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 you know, talk to us. You know, call your local outlaw for it if you have questions about that. But the all the stuff still applies. Mm-hmm. It's still super super important. And again, like in Toyota, it's even it's. It could I could argue that in Forerunner and Tacoma, not proper gears. If you get the 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 real high gear ratios, numerically low, but you know, mm-hmm. ratio high, it's freaking terrible if you throw 33s on this. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's yeah. just like, oh my God, will this thing get out of its own freaking way? Because the answer is no, no it won't. Mm-hmm. It absolutely no, won't. No, they are laughing. Tor- tor- especially I would say the the new Tacomas are the most prevalent. And I think one of the biggest frustrations and complaints we hear about. Uh, you put just a two eighty five seventy seventeen on a uh, newer Tacoma. I would say sixteen and newer, and they're like, "What? Yeah, it's not even a thirty three. No. <laughs> it's like, like, why is my why so is my bad. transmission constantly going up and down, up and down, up and down? And it's on a flat road. So bad. Like, yeah, five twenty nines there, buddy. Uh, and then the guys who are thinking zero to sixty in four point five yeah, weeks. Eventually, yes, it maybe. <laughs> uh, so then they're bad. like, "Well, I want thirty fives, and I have, we actually." Uh, I heard uh, Charlotte quote a set of 37s on a Tacoma. He was like, yeah, we'll just cut and trim and whatever. Like, I don't think there's a gear ratio deep enough for 37s on a Tacoma. 
I mean, axle, axle swap. swap yeah, you're but if get. you're keeping the factory <laughs> stuff, like, uh-uh. you're not daily yeah, in it's, that. It's gonna be a six. No, I, I've seen, I've seen some internet guys trying to do that. The problem then is the housings on the those Tacomas and Forerunners. They're not that big. They're like eight, and a, eight, eight, and eight and quarters. Um, the clamshell on the front, I think, is usually like an eight or an eight and a quarter. Um, they're just not big enough. The pinion gets so small. I mean, you know, and that's that's kind of the crappy thing about those, the Toyotas. Anything really. Most of the IFS stuff, especially like the fabricated stuff, like the F9, whatever you want to call it, the third member, we'll call it just third member stuff. That stuff gets expensive, and it's not because of the rear axle. Uh, it's because of the front axle. That's what drives IFS stuff sky high. That's what sky, you know, when you're getting a quote on a JL and it's like two grand, that same job on a Toyota Tacoma, add another $1,000. And the it's it's parts and labor because the parts aren't as prevalent, so the companies that actually have those gears – um, they're fewer and they're far between far. That's not a word, but you know what I mean? Um, so they're going to charge more. It's just simple economics. It's supply and demand. And then the labor is a lot more. And, you know, you know, Jeeps are one of those things you can say what the book calls for, but a good gear tech's going to beat the book. You, you just go by the book when it comes to Toyota with clamshell IFS, it just is what it is. And it's very, very easy to North. You're, you're going to sky up over three grand for, for a decent IFS gear job. It just is what it is. But it'll make even more of a difference in those vehicles than it would in any Jeep. Oh, for yeah, sure. Absolutely. 100% agree. So, up to this point, like I said, I think that's definitely a weekend warrior build. That's something that most people are going to want to do if they're they're wheeling regularly, but they're not fully committed to jumping in to what I think is obviously going to be the most expensive <laughs> uh, upgrade you can do, which is a full on axle swap. Um, that's right, baby. Go get there a credit you go. card. Get, get ready load. to uh, cry a little bit because this one's going to hurt. Uh, the cheapest way to do it is if you've got a sport and you want to just bump up a little bit, like you said, you want to just get to that forties threshold. Uh, you can swap Rubicon axles in, you can do all those same, same things to a Rubicon or usually buy somebody's takeoffs. Who's already done that, which that gets significantly cheaper, put them on your sport. Mm -hmm. Then you have a great set of 44s with everything usually already done. Uh, but if you've got the Rubicon 44 and you're like, nah, I want more, I want bigger, I want stronger. Well, Guess what? You got to pay for it now. Um, so yep. what are we looking at for, and we can break this into tiers of different axle categories as well, but what's your, uh, someone just says, Hey, I'm, you know, I've got X amount budget. I just, I, I need bigger axles and 44s. What are we going with? So there's the, there's the option that, you know, we call it the stay the five lug or the semi float option. We'll get into semi float and full float in another episode. That's a whole different thing. Um, but, you know, we'll just, you know, for right now, we'll just call it five lug and uh, eight lug, you know, eight lug mafia. Shout out to the eight lug mafia guys. Um, uh, if you stay five lug, I, I look at Curry's got a setup like this right now for the JL and JT. They call it their HD and they have an HD 44 and they have an HD 60 for the front. They have an HD 60 for the rear and it stays semi float, which means you stay. You're not quite as strong as full float. Full float is big boy, one ton stuff. Um, so you're not quite up there in the in the big boy axle stuff, um, but you're staying five lug means you don't have to change your wheels. I mean, we don't talk about it, but that's an expense. I mean, wheels are not cheap, right? That's an expense. It's, it could be a couple thousand dollars for a decent set of wheels these days, or or more if you go for. I mean, that's it's a big cost, especially if you're somebody who started to build your Jeep or your or your vehicle, and you've already bought wheels and tires, and you want to keep those wheels. That's a cost you got to think about. So, right off the bat, by going with an HD like a Curry setup. Uh, or or staying semi float, you're going to save potentially a couple to a few thousand dollars. So that right there, initially savings there, um, and then by you're going to upgrade the strength. So axle tubes are going to be bigger, axle tube walls going to be thicker, axle shafts are already going. They're going to be they're not only going to be better metal, they're going to be thicker. They're going to be more spline. You're talking thirty five forty spline instead of you know twenty seven to thirty two, um, and spline count is a real thing. The up to a point more is better. Um, 40 is considered 35 is real good. 40 is considered. All right. Um, race car stuff is usually 40. Um, race car light would be 35. So you're going to get all of that stuff. You're going to get, everything's going to be upgraded, but you're not going into like the full on big boy outers. You're going to keep your factory outers. So you're keeping your factory brakes. You're not replacing calipers. You're going to keep your, you know, those hubs, all that stuff there, the bolt out hubs, ease of maintenance down the road. You get to keep all of that. So you're saving money now and you're saving money in the future. And those axles generally come at a price point 20 to 30% cheaper just off the shelf. Forget the stuff we're talking about, the other savings. 
than their full float counterpart. So that's one thing that you can do. And I'm, and I'm using Curry only because I've looked at them recently and I've sold them recently. I know Dynatrack has another option. Curry, you can actually kind of pick your front and save like $2,000. Uh, if you go, you could do an HD 44, HD 60 rear combo, or you could just do an HD 60 front and rear combo. And either way, you're going to be, like I said, 20 or 30% less than going like full, full float 60s or full on right. 70s, something or five nine. And I want to say so that's kind of step one of the actual. Yeah, I want to say Fusion has their 44 60 combo. East Coast has a has a combo very do. similar yeah. to that. I think they do. Yeah. Um, yep, yep, yep. yeah so there, that's your that's your semi float. And then. Uh, it's getting popular it and is. it should yeah, i mean it's a good option i like that option i think it's a great yeah, I option mean, for i want to say for for 90 percent of the people who now, now we're really niching down the the industry so we're going to take the weekend warrior and then take the weekend warrior who the 90 percent of those guys who are really really going off road and, and testing themselves yeah. that semi float combination is going to serve 90 percent of those guys the other 10 percent a lug baby <laughs> <laughs> yeah which i mean then you're then your whole world changes. It is. It's, um, you know but again even in eight lug world you've got the hardcore junkyard dog mm-hmm. guys that are like i can do my axle swap in a weekend for a thousand bucks and i'm like all right bud show me <laughs> <laughs> show me go that for receipt. it like i don't uh, i don't know what to no, tell you uh, man but, i you know they're going to junkyards and they're right. doing that stuff which so, is fine I, i'm in that i category. generally don't talk about that i generally <laughs> right. don't uh, it's not something i'm going to recommend to hardly anybody anymore i went that route on the yeah. LJ because I thought I could, you know, working for a shop, I could significantly reduce my cost down. Um, but now that I am axles, wheels, tires, shafts, drive shafts, brakes, whole everything, every bearing had to be pulled out. Every seal had to be pulled out. Everything had to be cleaned. To Not them. to mention the yeah, 20 plus hours that we have into just cutting off the stupid brackets on these things, all of the, all of these things add up on labor because I don't have the tools and experience to do this myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm from a, from a retail standpoint, I'm probably 14 grand into it easily. Well, you hit the nail on the head right there. Um, You hit it right there. You, you put the whole thing about junkyard axles into one thing. If you're that guy that's going to do it on his own, you're going to source the axles. You're going to source your parts. You're going to do your own labor. You can weld, you can cut, you got all that stuff, more power to you. But I don't talk to those kind of people. Right. Well, and <laughs> as, even, as as a shop, yeah, we don't talk to those kind of people and they don't generally talk to us. They might ask us for advice, but they're not going to they're not going to ask us to do it for them. Most likely. I mean, um, but <laughs> even then, like side the, the cost of the parts themselves just to get that to fit under not not we're not talking about brakes, gears, lockers, anything like that, just to make oh, them thousands. fit under a Jeep have, have gone up substantially over the last couple of years. So when someone's like, "Hey, no, I, I that, found a set of uh, junkyard tons, and I want you guys to do them," I, I will, I will talk you out of that. From my experience, I will talk you out of that every single day. It's not worth the headache. I mean, I'll try. It's not. And then you're, they usually, I mean, my rig's mm-hmm. been LJ's been down for well over a year and a half now. Um, and part of that scheduling issue, and I'm, I mean, obviously, I'm not going to bump my Jeep in front of customers or anything like that. But if I'm relying on someone else to weld these things for me and put that axle together for me and do the gears for me, I'm on their schedule. Um, so yeah. therefore, I have not been able to wheel the LJ in a pretty long time. I can't wait to get it back out. But that's another thing you have to consider when you're looking at this. So moving away from junkyard, we won't get into that too far. Uh, that might be an episode one day, but, um, Moving on from there, nah. full float, 60, 70, 80. Whew. What are we looking at? Fab Fa- nine, oh, yeah, fabricated nine. axles. Absolutely. A lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Just, <laughs> you're, just, <laughs> just, just, you're looking at a lot of money, but, I mean, you're looking at a lot of peace of mind. Right. Like, you know, race car, 4699 has Curry Platinum 70s on it. They are, aside from a few tweaks that we had to make for the suspension and a few tweaks we had to make for it being a race car, it is 80 80 to 85 percent the same axle that you would go to curry four by four uh their website and buy right. um you know i didn't do electronic lockers because it's a race car you don't do electronic lockers but um they're auto lockers because it's a race car but the actual physical lo- axle as you look at it it's the same stuff um but they're 70s and you know 60 and 70 the difference usually is just this intersection it's not a massive difference 60 70 80 this stuff in the middle mm-hmm. bigger um but you start talking about like three and a half inch tubes on the front, sometimes four. You start talking about four inch tubes on the mm-hmm. rear. You start talking about half inch steel wall thickness on these tubes. Like this is big boy stuff, guys. This is cool guy stuff. 
And the reason, the primary reason that you do it is because you want to be able to not have to worry. Um, I know that unless I do something absolutely dumb, that axle is going to stay out of the car. It's not going anywhere. It's not, there's not a, there's not a, I don't have to worry about, well, I know I upgraded it, but can I really run this? Can I, no, 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 send it. You have that send it peace of mind because that's how you wheel or you race or you love to go out there and jump, you know, jump the jump mm-hmm. something or go to the whatever. Or you've just got an, it's like the whole thing with shocks and resis if you don't need resis or you've just got the budget where you just want to you're willing to pay for peace of mind. I totally get that. Totally get that. That's what bigger axles do. Everything is bigger. Everything is thicker. Everything is just better built better. It's just better. Yeah. Everything is better. Um, and you do that so you get that peace of mind. You're paying for the peace for of sure. mind. For sure. And then that's, you know, that's something I would recommend. Heavy, heavy, heavy use on a 40 and moderate, immediate, you know, normal abuse on a 42, 43. I don't know anyone personally running right. bigger than a 43. Um, there's not really a need to, honestly, unless you're doing rock buggy, bouncer type stuff. Um, yeah, like you nailed it. You hit the head on the nail, I mean, though. It's, it's point, just assurance just... that you can drive that thing. Right. anywhere however you want and get it off the trail and you're good to go now with that though keep in mind replacement parts if you do break something do go up astronomically <laughs> when you get into those axles on some yeah not at all i mean some people can build some people there are 60s out there that use commercially available parts and that's something to consider you know it makes things easier um there's some fabricated nine inch stuff that uses some commercially available parts um but again the initial investment is going to be it's it's going to be high. I mean, it just is what it is. Investment down the road, not so much. Initial investment, yeah, you're going to spend more money because, you know, look at what you're exactly. doing. Exactly. Yeah, and like I said, this is for probably of the entire of the percentage. entire Jeep community. We're probably talking one to three percent, ten percent of ten yeah. percent. Um, yeah. it's it's ten percent of ten yeah. percent, which I guess is one yeah. percent, but it's, not, it's much. not much. But when you look at hundreds of thousands of vehicles out there, there are hundreds and hundreds of people doing this every year across the country um a quick look at social media you'll see people posting about you know we do it you post pictures of axles showing up you know so it is a thing it is it is enough of a thing to where companies exist simply to sell axles i.e dynatrack i.e fusion i.e some of east coast some of curry like it's a thing and it's it's big enough you know even at one to three percent of the market Still a lot of people yeah, doing lot. swaps. And, and certain yeah, people should. And also, the other, I want to kind of throw this in there too, the other assurance and probably a reason, and this is probably the reason I see most often for people upgrading their axles beyond A44 is um, a Hemi swap. If you're, if you're throwing more power down, um, A, you've got to stop faster and you need bigger brakes to stop faster. Only way to put much bigger brakes on is a bigger axle. Uh, two, more power means we're going to break more things. Um, so if you are hemi swapping, LS swapping, whatever, um, you'd really need to consider looking at those bigger axle housings because as, uh, <laughs> as the owner of the outlaw Charlotte has figured out, uh, a Hellcat and a Dana 60 rear does, doesn't play well. Um, even even going into upgraded axles like that, you're you're breaking things. So that's when you get into upgraded lockers, upgraded shafts, upgraded wall thickness, upgraded tubing, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so if that's if if engine swaps in your plans, axles should be in your plans as well. I think if you're gonna beat on it, I mean, think about it. The 392 Wrangler comes with 44s. Yeah. Now they're a little beefed up, and they don't have the center axle disconnect. Um, and and you can run that around if you're buying a 392 to just have fun around the you know grocery store parking lot probably not probably not your thing, but when you look at 46.99 and the Hellcat in Charlotte, one of those is just over 600 horsepower, one of those is just over 700 horsepower. Um, if we didn't have built axles, I've got 70s in mind. I now think the Hellcat has what 80s front and rear. Now? Um, it's an 80 rear, and then the biggest 60 I've ever seen in my life. We're talking right. like four inch tubes and, um, and like half inch wall thickness. Like these are massive. I mean, that's what my 70s. Right. <laughs> it's, it's big boy right. axles. I've seen the, the new front. It's, but it's pretty an 80 it's rear pretty for nasty, sure. But yeah. you have to mm-hmm. do that. It's for him. A lot of what he's got going on is pinion size versus ring gear size. That's where a lot of his that's where a lot of his stuff is has happened. Um, but yeah, I mean, 
he's just over i think the difference between 4699 and the hellcat's about 100 horsepower somewhere around that maybe just maybe just under 100 horsepower but from those two back down to a regular 392 is well over 100 horsepower from the race car down to a regular one and over 200 horsepower i mean that's another freaking honda accord like that's another v6 that's another modern v6 you've thrown in there um, so you've, you haven't quite doubled the power, but close to it. You ain't far and again, from that, and that, comes, far like from I said, that comes down to the 1%, like that, that's not your yeah, everyday sure. thing. Um, so just to kind of wrap up the thoughts here, um, there are so many different ways you can scale up axle upgrades. Like we said, from truss and gussets to upgraded shafts and, and none of that, you don't have to do those things at the same time either. It's nice to do it just one and done, but if your budget only allows a little bit at a time, then yeah, go for truss and gussets. Then down the road, grab some axle shafts and then upgrade as needed. Um, so like we said, per budget, per tire size, how much abuse you're going to throw at it, that's going to dictate the level of axle upgrades you need all the way up to spending quite literally another new car <laughs> uh, for just axles. Um, Doug, what are your, what are your final thoughts tube on works. that? <laughs> My thought are tube works absolutely cost what a new Jeep costs, but man, they're beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I priced those out once for the race car. I'm like, uh, no, uh, they ain't a 4,600 car with the exception of two or three uh, Broncos that have that kind right. of budget for 50 to sixty thousand dollars worth of axles but my god those things are so yeah, beautiful are. like those are the axles you dream about like those are, mm, that's the stuff axle heaven's made of <laughs> um whew. but i do think i think you've got to unless you're super knowledgeable i think the takeaway here is you know we've we've kind of put everything into one little 45 50 minute thing where you learn what you can do and what's out there and what's available i think I think anybody who's listening just needs to take their specific situation and apply it. As we always say, apply it to what we're saying. You come out of it with what you need and then go find somebody who is equally as knowledgeable who can kind of help you guide you through that. Um, but don't be the guy. I Don't be the, I want to act. Don't be the, I'm going to send an email in and ask for advice to a shop. And then you have no intention. Bubba Brian, the owner of um, uh, Exodus off Exodus down in uh, Texas used to be Exodus Chiefs. Now it's Exodus four by four. He does a lot of axle swaps, does a lot of, um, does a lot of that big boy stuff. He's an ex Marine and I forgive him for that, but he posted somebody sent him an email the other day, asking him for advice on an engine swap. And he's like, ignore. <laughs> he's like, we know enough. These guys are not going to buy anything. They just want us to tell them a bunch of stuff for free. And then they're going to move on. And in that, and in that format, I totally agree with Bubba on that. You know, you're going to a guy that's literally just trying to you know run a business day to day and make money. And you're just trying to pump him for information. That's why I think things like this, this podcast, the stuff that we try and do um, to try to take away some of that from them um, and try to save some of their time. Cause you know, I'm that guy too, that gets the emails and gets the requests. And I'm like, seriously, I know you're just milking me for information. You're never going to do anything. You're going to go off and do something different. So that would be, that's my little soapbox for the day. But I still say involve a knowledgeable off-road pro or a shop or for something sure. like that. Just uh, show them the love, you know, tip your weight staff. They're hardworking people. <laughs> They're all just trying to get through law school. Yeah, we're, we're just trying to get all through this. It's it's all good. <laughs> yeah, I think that um, I think that wraps it up. Unless you can think of any other axle upgrades that we didn't cover. Uh, I think those are going to be your key points. And that's definitely warrants more than the uh, the, the typical 15 minute mailbag response. So I think yeah, we're at almost 50 minutes here now. Yeah. So. I think the only thing I would say is if you are in that 1%, you are looking at big axles, um, hashtag consider fabricated. Just don't forget the fabric. Don't forget the fabricated axles. Talk to your off-road pro about that. Fab 9s, Fab 10s, they're great. They weigh less. There's, they're all positives. There, there's, really no, there's really no negatives there. Um, and now nowadays, they're pretty much the same price. So if you're going to do it, if you're going to go big boy, you're going to go eight lug, you're going to join the one-ton mafia, um, definitely look at fab nine slash fab 10 and they're all the same housing. You just different right. gears. So fabricated axles, definitely take a look at that. Other than that, I got my little, eh, my little piece in there for fabricated axles. Feel good. Um, feel better yeah. Now. That's all I got, man. I don't know. I <laughs> okay, do good. a little bit like it's mildly better. Um, I need another energy drink. Cause I sat down to film this without getting one. And I'm, I'm like really mad at myself now. I'm like, Caleb talk more so I can run away. <laughs> but, but maybe next, next time. time. 
So yeah, that's all I got. That's uh, I think we're good. I think we've covered everything. So as always, guys, uh, we do thank every each and every one of you for listening. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share it everywhere. Get this information out there. Leave us some leave us some great reviews on the pod, on the Apple Podcast side. Throw down your comments on the YouTube side. Um, we're we're just out here doing this for everybody else because believe me, there ain't no money coming out of it. So <laughs> we're just doing it because there's definitely a need for it in our industry. Um, there's definitely a, 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 a thirst for it and a need might be an understatement, but it definitely needs to be out there. So we're going to keep doing this. We're going to keep putting the information out there. Um, if you guys have any ideas for stuff that you know, you'd know you like to know, you've heard something on a Facebook group, whatever, we do get a lot of information from those groups. Definitely let us know. And again, like, comment, subscribe. This has been Dirt to Dust. That's all I've got. Caleb, I'll see you next, see time. You next time. Everyone else, we'll see you on the next episode. Dirt to Dust, we're out. You've been listening to the Dirt to Dust, presented by Outlaw Off-Road, the premier off-road centers for Jeeps, trucks, and SUVs. Sounds a little bit arrogant, doesn't it? Oh, well. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. Be sure to tell your friends about the show, too. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime... To see more and to see what Outlaw Off-Road offers, hit the website at theoutlawoffroad.com. See you next time. Don't follow us. You're not going to make it.